Um, all right, well, let's jump into it. Um, so the three kind of topics that I put on here, so I said, you know, it's about how to grow and sustain a group. Um, and so I kind of broke that down into like some of the tactical things about just how does Meetup work, right? Mm -hmm. Like as a platform, then just like, what is it to, to plan events and like get attendance mm -hmm. for events, right? right? And then like how to get help beyond just doing it all yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause I mean, I think those three things are kind of what it means to have a Meetup group is that mm -hmm. you're planning events through the Meetup platform and you know, hopefully you've got other resources, right? Like this mm -hmm. obviously is a resource right now, yes. uh, but um, uh, throughout, if you have other questions, just let me know. Because okay. uh, this is, uh, yeah. All right, so, go ahead. No, uh, <laughs> uh, but number zero before one, two, and three is why are you starting the meetup group? So, you know, you two already, we've already talked about this before sure. we started, but, you know, I think it's always really important to think through that question. Um, and, uh, you know, we've done that at other sessions here. Uh, and, you know, that question really has multiple parts to it. So, like, what unmet need does it serve, right? Um, why is it a series of in person events, right? Because there's, okay, so there's a need. There's many different ways to serve that need though. Why specifically is a series of in-person events a good way to serve that need? And then the last part, like why you? Why, why are you doing this series of events? Why are you running it? And then why now? Why at this point, um, you know, so that's kind of that. So here is what my story was around that. So. Uh, April, you've heard a lot of this before, but uh, I uh, uh, have a YouTube channel. Um, it has been a passion of mine for a long time. Uh, it has been around for a decade. So it, I've been a YouTuber for a long time. Um, being a YouTuber, especially here in Chicago, is pretty lonely. Um, it is not easy to find where other YouTubers physically exist, you know, partially because of privacy, but it's just not part of the YouTube platform to say like, where is that person? How would I find them? How can I contact them? Right. Um, to the extent that, you know, there are nexuses of YouTubers, they tend to be where big media uh, nexuses are. So Hollywood, uh, Los Angeles, New York, Toronto's the other one in North America, that's like the Canadian New York or Hollywood. Uh, and then, you know, globally, you know, London, Paris, places like that. And YouTube has physical spaces there and has programming that you could show up to as a YouTuber and oh, really? meet other YouTubers, right? Cool. That's awesome. Yeah. I have, I literally in 2016 flew to Toronto because that was closer than the other ones. So I could go to an event and like meet other people and it was great, but then they were all Canadian and like I, I had no way to like really stay in touch with them in a meaningful way after the event. Um, so being a YouTuber, especially here in Chicago, is fundamentally lonely. And like, good. How are you? Hey, can I help you making a drink or eat right now? Yeah, I'm gonna get um, a gluten sandwich. Sure. Are there French fries or cool fries? I'm sorry. What's the option? Uh, so fries are fries are French. Regular French. Just regular French. Okay. And your pack water? Yeah. Uh, I'd like to do the ginger peach cider okay. and the uh, pesto wrap with uh, fries. Can I have the chicken Caesar wrap? Okay. And do you want fries too? Yes. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm going to just quickly tweet this. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Uh, I am a constant social media poster. If you, yeah. Uh, so that was kind of the first thing that. Being a YouTuber is lon lonely. Um, I 
was lonely as a YouTuber in Chicago. Online groups don't cut it. I'm part of multiple groups online on Facebook, private Slack channels for other creators, YouTubers. And, um, you know, I am able to get good information. Like I see what other people are talking about. I can ask questions and people respond. But, you know, people might respond three hours later, two weeks later. You know, it's asynchronous. Uh, and, you know, you don't necessarily build a strong connection in those, at least I wasn't able to. Um, uh, and then I needed people who understood my particular pain. Um, so being a YouTuber, I had this, uh, I had turned it into a full-time business and then something changed in the YouTube algorithm and my revenue dropped by 40% overnight. And uh, my dream job turned into a nightmare. I had to lay off my employee, cancel our health plan, move out of our office, uh, oh. and then go back and get a day job again. Dang it. And, you know, I can explain that to people, but then I have to explain, like, how YouTube monetization works. Whereas when I talk to other YouTubers, they have uh, a depth of knowledge there where they can understand and commiserate with me in a way that most people can't. Yeah. Um, and so I just, I really needed that last year. Um, so the other things, like as I was thinking about a group, I was like, well, I also literally have been doing YouTube for a decade. And while I do not have a YouTube certification, it means that I know a lot that anyone who's just getting into YouTube or is two years in, but not a decade in, could, could benefit from. So, and I also like teaching and sharing information. So that was another thing that I saw, like, yeah, I would like, I have something that people want that I could use to lure people in and then they can give me group therapy. Uh, that was <laughs> more or less my rationale under it was, um, and then I have been looking for this group to exist in Chicago for eight years. Like when I was starting out, uh, I was like, I, I looked for this on Meetup, like there's gotta be something for YouTubers in Chicago. I mean, there's tons of us, like just like, because there are so many YouTubers, like, and this is a major mo metropolitan area, there have to be, right? But they, you know, again, the public YouTubers I could find either in Chicago moved to Los Angeles, like wouldn't respond to like my one-off messages or there'd be like one event, like YouTube came and brought all Illinois YouTubers together for a day, but they organized it and it was like very hard to keep in touch. We planned like one event after that, but like I did a lot of the planning, nobody really showed up. And then I like, I didn't have the energy or know how to do it back then. Um, so like I've literally just been waiting for, and like there's uh, the International Academy of Web Television I joined uh, and like worked to get a Chicago meetup set up and three people came and then like nothing ever happened. So I have tried this actually <laughs> through other formats for a long time and like just it didn't happen or I wasn't really ready to step up and be the leader and like really make something happen. I was just hoping somebody else would do it. So really it has just been because nobody else has done it that I was just like last year is like, okay, I have to do it. Like literally nobody else is going to do it if I don't. So I have a question about yeah. that though. So how is it that Meetup, like what was it about the format of Meetup that it's a great made question. It better than like going through YouTube or going through the like yeah. you talked about web? So what uh, appealed to me about Meetup, thank you, um, is I had started going to Meetups, right? Like I had been going to the content strategy and like gotten really great information out of it. It had helped me grow professionally. Um, you know, I was able to meet people in a like structured way without, you know, um, and I had gone to other Meetups where they were just more like, um, so I'd just gone to meetups a lot and like it was one of the ways I would find like other people who had a specific interest in Chicago, right? Mm -hmm. I can't think of another website that is as good at like helping me find that. Mm -hmm. um, so that was kind of like why I chose meetup, which is also a really great segue into um, my next section. Uh, oh, this is like action steps based on what I just said. So you could like, look at your group and event descriptions with those kind of needs, reasons, and skills that you're bringing to this in mind. You can also think about what other people's needs would be, but like, you know, 
like I literally, when I would reach out to people would say, being a YouTuber is lonely, right? Like I feel that and I assume they feel it. So I would always put that in there and that like, I'm looking to connect because like I'm lonely mm -hmm. and like lonely in this specific way that I think we could connect. Um, and you know, I put that in event descriptions and things as well, you know, in different ways. Um, and then every time somebody actually shows up to an event, like I greet them and I ask them like, why did you come? Like, what is the thing that brought you specifically here today? Because getting somebody to actually show up at your event, like is a huge data point, right? They like you it has succeeded, right? They are, they are the person who you, who heard the, the message, whatever it was and actually came. Uh, and then, you know, beyond that, like, what, what is it, what is the need that they had that this is answering or what other needs might they have that we could answer in future events? Um, uh, and then, you know, so like, if, if you take nothing else away from like everything else I'm going to talk about, like, these are kind of the core things that I just think about, like, why did I start doing this when other people then respond? What brought them in and how can I use that information as the core of any future event or event description that I do. So that's kind of my big thing. But to get to your question of why meetup. So that's like this whole section is like why meetup. Um, so what is meetup? Um, you could describe it in a lot of different ways. These are five different ways I would describe it. And I'm going to pause to take a drink. Um, um, let me just make sure nobody is uh, chatting our thing. Great. Um, so to me, and I kind of already said this, that Meetup, the thing that it does better than any other website is that it is a discovery platform for local interest groups. So I'm in Chicago, I'm a YouTuber, and I want to go to an event, right? And I go to the website to, to Meetup to look for local interest groups. And it is good at giving, showing me, here's lots of local interest groups. I can type in words, it'll show me 10 different things related to that. Once I've put in my preferences, it shows me at like, you know, L I'm gay, so I have LGBTQ is one of my things. So it's constantly showing me all the Chicago LGBTQ groups I could join, right? So if I go to Facebook, it doesn't necessarily proactively show me specifically, here's a group that has events that is near you, right? And has at least some interest that you've either typed in or put in your profile. Meetup is specifically designed to do that, to show and surface that is the meat of Meetup, right? There's, no, there's nothing else, right? It's not about posts or photos that you can do those things. It's about local groups. So that to me is like why Meetup stands out and then also it's pretty easy to use and like free to a th certain threshold yeah. um so be beyond groups it's also kind of a discovery platform for events whether or not you are connected to the group because it does also show events uh in that way you know you could also think about it as eventbrite as being a competitor that's for events um but you know Eventbrite is not really for groups. You can create groups on Eventbrite, but that's not really what it shows on the front page or shows really well. Like I do follow some things, group local groups on Eventbrite, but only because I saw an event from them and then was like, oh, I can follow them? I didn't even know that was a thing on Eventbrite. Whatever. Yeah. Um, Facebook has groups which could be regionally located, but that's rare, right? That it exists, but I mean, like, and I have a Facebook group that goes along with my meetup group, but I use that more for just posting and sharing because the interface there is a lot better than the meetup interface, but it's not specifically about local events and getting people there. Uh, so meetup is also an event management platform. You can set up events. They, you know, have venues that are pre-populated, built in. They have different ways to RSVP. All that kind of options is built in. It's much better than like, Facebook's event interface. Um, uh, I haven't used Eventbrite, but uh, Eventbrite I feel is more for paid events, even though it is, you can do free events. That's just the feeling I get about Eventbrite. Uh, and so like 
meetup specifically is a place where people go to look for like free local events around a specific interest. Uh, it's a, also a group management platform, so you can have members and you know they can be at different levels. Uh, you can ban people, you know, those important things. And then it is a social communication platform in that people can talk to one another. I, I don't think, so these are kind of listed in decreasing order of importance to me. So that's kind of how I think about Meetup. Um, any thoughts, questions about Meetup as a platform? No, but I do. I I do find that Meetup is a lot. It seems like it's it's made up of people who want to support each other more than just if you go to an event. You know, hmm. you're, you're saying like Eventbrite. So I go to an event for Eventbrite. It's you know it. it I may not go there thinking I'm like, oh, there's going to be all kinds of kindred spirits here. It's right. You know, it's just people who are wanting to go to an event. It's yeah. a one-off thing. Yeah. 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 No, it it definitely has a sense of continuity and community in a way that mm -hmm. yeah, other places don't. Um, so this is my meetup. Uh, you guys know what meetup pages look like, so I'm not gonna like do a dissection of this. Um, but you know. Uh, you'll notice that my name, in addition to having the official title of Chicago Internet Creators, which is a description, I then, to d give more, to make it easier for people to say, oh, that's for me, I have descriptions of what do I mean by creator right there, YouTube, podcast, Twitch. Those are the types of... So this group used to be called Chicago YouTubers Meetup when I started, right? Because I didn't... I was That was my core group that I started with. Um, but as I've expanded and like talked to people, like just trying to, uh, I, I think that uses up pretty much like as many characters as you're allowed to have in a group title as possible. Um, so it has like a nice short thing that I can acronym CIC, but then it also has like some keywords to let people know like if if this word describes you, like this is for you. Um, and it also would then help with search and discovery. Um, you know, obviously, groups are located in a place. They have numbers of people. Um, you want to have some kind of photo associated with your group. Uh, now that I've had a successful event, right? Like I got a photo, and that's there. Before that, you know, you could use a stock photo, right? There's lots of great free stock resources. Unsplash is my favorite one. What is um, it? Unsplash. Unsplash. Um, it's uh, if you once you get familiar with the Unsplash library, you will see the photos everywhere on the internet. Ooh. It is it, like, I, I've seen, I've used them for several things now. I've used them for a couple of our events, like when I have the event set up, but I don't have a photo because it's just like, mm -hmm. it's an event. I don't know, there's no yeah. photo before the event. Right. So, but like, I'll think of it like th this one, I had the hands that make the heart, right? Yeah. That was from Unsplash. Mm. Um, or, you know, because I was like, oh, it's community, that makes sense, yeah. right? Uh, and I think I had just typed, like, community, group, and just done different things, and some of them were, like, silhouettes of people. I was like, no, I don't like that. So, you know, just kind of thinking of what's a way to visually represent it. Because so is this the group page or the event page? This is the group page, actually. Okay. So, I mean, I don't know, it would probably look different if you don't have a photo, but um, anyway, so... Within the group, there's a bunch of different settings you can do. So if yes. you go under Manage Group, then you'll have the group settings. Yes. So uh, Basics is basically everything that was on the last page. What's the title of your group? Is there a photo? What's the description of your group? Uh, that's There's not a lot what on the basics. What you call your members. Oh, yeah, and what you call your members. So my members are called creators. They used to be called YouTubers, but then I broad, broadened it. So I'm not, like the basics are pretty self-explanatory. Um, so then there's the your members section. Um, so that's where if people are joining the group, you can set different parameters. So I set it so that everyone who joins my group must be approved. I changed that because I was getting people who would join the group and then s just put spam messages of oh. like promoting something totally irrelevant. Yeah. And like that at first I was just like, oh, well let me ban them and then, but then I was like, wait, like, if I just, and like this person isn't even in Chicago, like, you know, but I was like, well, if I just have to look at people before they join, then it'll just be easier to prevent spammers. Um, so it, it's a little more work, but for me, especially at the size my group is at, it's like easier than to 
to, I don't know, I, I'm really protective of my group. So like any, like, cause somebody messaging on the group, I think that sends emails to people in the group. And like, I don't want people getting randomly emailed by a spammer because I, you know, didn't have that box checked. Um, so, uh, and that's also why I then required profile questions for anybody to join. So I just asked two questions like, what do you create? And if you have a link, put it here. Uh, and that's for two reasons. One, because people wanted to have a list of everybody else's channels and weren't really contributing that on their own. Uh, so now I just keep a running spreadsheet that this populates. And if people don't have one yet because they're just getting started, they just put nothing and then that's fine. But uh, this, I feel like, deters spammers because it takes that much effort to just type in a field real quick. And then it also gives me information about my members. Um, and so, you know, you could have this just be something like, why are you interested in a group? Right? Because again, that could be that key information that you want, like that helps you plan your next event or just, you know, what is something that you want to know from anybody who's just joining the group? Right? Like, because obviously when somebody shows up, you can pepper them with questions in person, but also just the people who join, what are they looking for? Right? Mm -hmm. That helps you think about like what events might actually, yeah. and if you force them to answer before they can even get in, so you don't have to like wait for responses as people join. And especially like now, you know, you're in the early phase where you just get people for free, right? right? Like, um, and so I don't have this information for the people who joined mm -hmm. the first few months of my group. That's okay. Yeah. I, it, um, I don't need it retroactively, but so putting this into place earlier, mm -hmm. then okay. it just sets a standard. Um, then the other thing is having a welcome message. So this is at the bottom of the page. You just type in text down there, but then it shows up as a nice little email anytime somebody joins the group. Uh, I know this because when I approve a person, it then lets me know if I want a copy of this email or just send it to them and I don't see it. So, and on the mobile app, you can't choose if you get a copy or not. So if I approve someone from the mobile, I always get a copy of this email. So I've seen this email a lot in my inbox. So it just says your photo, welcome, and then whatever message. So I use this as a way to also push people to our Facebook group, um, just because if they're joining the group, they probably would also like to be in the Facebook group because that's where we talk more. And then also, um, it just I also put events there, so it gives them a second way of being in the group uh, and knowing about events. And then I also have an email list because I have a background in digital marketing, so that's just natural for me. So I also send out MailChimp emails about every event. So I also push the uh, email list here. And then also because you don't get to see your members' email addresses directly through Meetup. That's not information Meetup shares with you. Right. So this is a way that I'm getting people's email list so that... Uh, why do you want both? Why do I want both? Like, isn't that double work? Why wouldn't you just rely on Meetup for the... Yeah. Um, so I started the email list because, um, you know, I had been contacting people one on one and they're like, I don't do meetup, but I'd be interested in the events. Do you have an email list? Um, you know, also e meetups emails are really basic. You can't do a lot of formatting. Sure. Um, I like being able, you know, I've done email marketing for a living, so I have opinions and, you know, like I want it to be mine. Right. Um, so that's, and you know, there's other reasons as well. Just like, uh, I also just like having people's email addresses in case I ever want to actually communicate with that person, me personally, not like that I'd give that information out to other random members in the group, but like, cause nobody checks their meetup messages, right? Sure. It's a terrible messaging platform. Sure. Email's just like better. So. Okay. Hey, so before you get off this page, yeah. so how do you, how do you get this on your page? So the, the welcome message for members, so that is under the your members section. So your members, and then at the very bottom is the welcome message to new members. And then you can just put whatever you want in it. So that's where I put the Facebook group because you can, I also have that in the event or the group description, but it's at the very bottom and you have to mm -hmm. expand. Was it open? I have it open. Yeah. Oh, okay. uh, the scissor up? I have the scissor up. Uh, I have the pesto. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, somebody's watching. Oh, maybe it's me. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, all right. Um, so this is about topics. Um, so that's another section there is you can have up to 15 topics that your meetup group is about. Mm -hmm. And um, you should have 15 things in there if you can come up with 15 words. As you start typing, it will show you um, topics that already exist and how many groups are using them. Um, uh, the three things I think about when I think about topics are what are the words that actually describe my group, right? So YouTube for me was a big one, right? So I wanted YouTube to be on there. Um, what are the words that are related and have lots of groups attached to them? Because that means that there's big listing pages that I want to be a part of. So social media, which like technically describes some of what goes on, but is a really broad category. There's 3,000 social media groups. I just want to like, so that there's going to be more traffic to social media in general because it's a broad topic. And then I also think about what are some niche topics that words that really describe my group that there aren't a lot of groups in. So that I'm also, so that's kind of um, in like search engine optimization, keyword strategy, thinking about both what are the big picture keywords, which might be really hard to stand out in, but you still want to be a part of. And then what are the really niche keywords Yep, that you can be really competitive against because you're one of the only people who actually hits that very specific thing, but aren't going to give you as much traffic, but it's going to be much better traffic because so when I put in the word uh, like Twitch, there's only 68 groups, but I'm one of the few groups, especially in Chicago, that serves Twitch and podcasters as well. Another huge or, you know, relatively sizable group. Um, so just having a mix of big and small and, you know, anything that like really, really describes your group and has a sizable amount. But, you know, there's like actually many variations on film or YouTube. And I tried to stay away from a lot of the film ones because that's not, film is not really what my group is about. So. Just and knowing that and knowing what other groups are out there and how they feel, that's it's I don't know. There's there's like a bit of an art and science to choosing topics, but um yeah. And plus I from what I understand too, is that if you refresh that feature every once in a while, they don't get more members. Mm. Because then it kind of gets sent out again. Right, like, so oh, there's a new group with in this category that yeah. you're interested in. Yeah. Mm. Um, and right, and because I think the topics then also match up to what members say I'm interested in this topic. Um, uh, optional features. There's not a lot on here that's super important. I just, so all meetup groups come by default with a mailing list that any member can message the whole group. I turn that off. Like, again, I just don't want members sending everybody a message. Um, and there's also a message board, which is different than the discussions, which are at the bottom of your group. And it's just like, it's another feature nobody should really be using, so I just turned it off. It'd be more like a forum view rather than a list view. Um, and then you can also, if you have like other pages for your group, connect them here, though Meetup hides this like at the bottom, bottom of your group page. So it's probably not super important to put things here because I doubt anyone ever sees this because people are always like, we have a Facebook group and I have it like officially here in the event description and now in everything. So, uh, and so then I also try to remind people at events, we also have a Facebook group. Um, uh, but yeah, these are just different things you can do to like, how do you set up your group on Meetup? Um, so kind of like recap here is do the basics of like writing what your group is, using a stock photo so you have a, a photo, add 15 topics because that is how people find you, right? People search for words and then Meetup says like, oh, this group, it has that word because of one of its topics, or they say, these are the topics I'm interested in. So if you don't have topics, you're not making use of Meetup's discoverability. Um, and then you know, deciding, is there a question you want to ask every member? And adding as a required profile question, 
and then adding that welcome mission. And I'll send these slides out afterwards uh, so you have all that. Um, next section will be about running an event, but I'm going to eat some food for a second. Good food. I'm looking forward to this section. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm not really comfortable running events. Yeah. I mean, I'm just, um, it's just not really my, my strong point. So it was something really, it was like something that I was afraid to do, but I just kind of jumped into it anyway. Mm -hmm. you know? So. I mean, that's another good outcome of it. Right. Double me doing it, but well, I guess my worst fears happen, you know, so when people, <laughs> people don't show up, but anyway. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you find a speaker? It sounds like you have a nice measure. Um, well, actually, in, in both cases, it was because of the organizers meetup that I found speakers. Um, like this Mark, is yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, Marsha McMahon, who frequently comes to this um, group, mm -hmm. um, I met her, um, and then I also met, um, you know, it was one of those things where I don't even know how it happened because it was like somebody was at this group, and I, I don't even remember her name anymore, but her, um, but she had a friend who was a financial planner, and she says, oh, well, you know, maybe you'd like to, you know, connect with my friend, and um you know, it was probably one of the easiest connections I ever made, you know, because that person, the person who she wanted to meet, me to meet actually contacted me. And, wow. um, you know, so, um, so, and those are the two people that I had, you know, that I had as speakers. But I mean, I was thinking, you know, kind of like going forward, I was thinking just in terms of contacting, you know, just get, like I said, I contacted this guy who had a story in the Tribune. Um, I didn't really ask him, oh, would you like to present something? I yeah. just kind of opened the door to it, but he didn't really, you know, bite. yeah, he didn't, he didn't really, yeah, he didn't really bite. So I thought, well, that's okay, because there's plenty of other people, because after you, mm -hmm. and Dave, you probably know this, and Tucson, you probably know it too, but um, it's like once you start thinking about, like, who you could connect with, it seems like that those things kind of pop up. Like I would see more articles in the paper, or there was um, there's a woman who does a talk on um, I know I can't I can't think of what her talk is, but she did a TED talk about um, uh, older uh, professionals and mm. what happened when they were okay. Like yeah, uh -huh. things great. Thank you. So I kind of started a list together. I mean, most of these people I hadn't contacted yet, but you know, I started putting a list together of like, oh, you know what, I should reach out to this person, reach out to that person, and. I just forget. In fact, Dave, I think you sort of inspired me about that because I think you had, I think on one of the early meetings where I met you, you said something like, oh, you called somebody up and you were like flabbergasted because they're like, oh, yeah, I'd like to come to your thing. Yeah. And so it's kind of surprising how, you know, that'll happen if you just start talking to people. Mm -hmm. about it. So, anyway. Well, to your point of like the, the guy in the Tribune article, you didn't yeah. really ask him. But when, so if you don't actually ask, yeah, <laughs> you don't true. actually get, so, but once you start asking, right, then, mm -hmm. then you will get, you know, answers. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I found a lot of people who have experience and are willing to talk and often uh -huh. it's because, mm -hmm. right, they probably have some kind of service that they are also mm -hmm. like the financial planner makes mm -hmm. total sense. The person who talked last night. She's, you know, an Emmy award winning video producer and she was talking about video production basics. Oh. But she gives that this talk like basically for free to anybody. And then, you know, it's like, and I also sure. do paid consulting yeah. and that will teach you how to do this more in depth. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know that my group was like a great target audience, but she also had fun talking to people who were mm -hmm. doing it for fun as opposed to business and things like yeah. that. So. Hmm. All right, so event planning. Who here is like a professional event planner? None of us, right? But that's the thing, you're an event planner now. And event planning is like a whole field of expertise. Um, and then you're also a promoter, right? You're not only putting on an event, but you're promoting it and getting people to sign up to it. Like two totally separate jobs that you've taken on by becoming a meetup organizer, mm -hmm. right? Um, 
So when I think about events, I think about them in this order. Where and when, because until you have a venue and a time, like nothing else really matters. Um, then like what what is the subject gonna be? You know, who's it gonna be talking? And like, you know, obviously those two things have to kind of go hand in hand because if you have a speaker, their availability, but you also have to know the space's availability at the same time and you know, so, and depending on which of those is easier for you to get a space or to get a person, you know, you can think about that, but this is the order it works for me. And then third, who's gonna show up, right? So like, first I just need to think about like, what is the core of the event? Where is it happening? When is it happening? What's the actual content? And then who's coming to the event? That's how I think about it. So kind of going through each of those, um, where, so thinking about what are free spaces that you can reserve. Um, so as members of this group, my understanding is we have access to a limited feature within Meetup that allows us to reserve WeWork spaces for free. Whoa. So um, if you go to the create, create event bu button, and see book a space, you have access to that. That is what we were told last year when I joined this group that that was a thing that was specifically for people in this group because this was an officially a meetup sponsored meetup. Right. It's not anymore. Ah. They, I guess, pulled all the funding at the beginning of the year mm -hmm. and aren't, but you know, uh, Gene and Veronica are like still making it happen. Uh, but that's also why our attendance is so much lower because mm. Meetup used to send emails to every single Meetup organizer in Chicago weeks in advance for every single one of these events. So that's why we used to have 20 people and now we only have three because mm. now we're not getting that extra push from Meetup. Mm. That's my theory at least. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so WeWork free integration, great. I have done, I think, four of my six events at WeWork Spaces. Mm. Yeah. Um, uh, and um, that's great. Other things that are free and reservable, library conference rooms, those go months in advance though, so you need to be thinking far in advance. Um, there's this space up in Lakeview called Nextdoor. It's run by an insurance company, but it has free reservable rooms and spaces. I've used that for previous groups that I've done. Um, thinking about whether there's a possible corporate sponsor. And by sponsor, I mean just like a willing to let you use a space and not pay for it. Mm -hmm. So Veronica knows somebody here, which is why mm -hmm. we get these spaces, right? Um, previous things I've worked for or meetups I've gone to, like somebody works for a company and then, or knows somebody who works for a company and lots of like, companies downtown are willing to host events like this because um, they, you know, these events often tend towards the professional side, right? Mm -hmm. So like a meetup for coders, um, like I go to the Chicago Web Design Accessibility Forum. That's not the official name, but it's something like that. If you type it into meetup, you'll find it. Um, and so they are a talent pool that uh, companies here want access to, so when you sign in, then you get an email from the company that says, here's all the jobs we have. Mm. Um, and so that's kind of the trade-off that some places have. Okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we're all good. Thank you. Um, also, depending on what your meetup is, you could also, you know, like if it's a book group, that might be something you do at members' living rooms if it's small enough. Like I used to be part of a book group, not through Meetup, but it was like we just rotated who hosted. Um, so like that's an option depending on like how much you trust the people in your group and right. all that kind of stuff. And you could have it so that maybe the location is undisclosed publicly and you send that mm -hmm. privately to people who are SVP or have a sit, that might be why you want a separate email list if the Meetup group mm. is just more like people get in, but then you have like some vetting process and whoever actually shows up or is coming gets an email location. So it's not like publicly dispersed, this is where this person lives. Mm -hmm. Stuff like that. Um, 
depend like there's athletic meetup groups um, and foodie meetup groups. Those are more going to be like a public park or a restaurant. Um, but you know, a lot of these places are like kind of free. Uh, then there's this thing called Peer Space, which I looked into before I knew about WeWork, where there's just it's like Uber but for event spaces. So okay. you can just say like, I want a room that fits this many people in Chicago, and there's a map, and you can look at different companies just rent, but you have to pay for that. Mm -hmm. So, um, um, but you know, depending on your requirements, there's all sorts of things. But I think just thinking about who you know that like works at a place that has a nice space and might be open to it is a way to think about it. So um, my group, um, so at, we've done four at WeWork. Those have been the one I have organized. My co-organizers though, one of them knows somebody who uh, is a manager at a hotel and was able to convince them to let us use one of their event spaces for free. Uh, and uh, the other one works at 1871 which is um, this uh, like incubator slash co-working type space uh, in Merchandise Smart. So they are able to host events there. Uh, so they booked a room there uh, and hosted the thing. So different people in your group, is, you know, once you have more people in your group, might also have options or you know, friends or other things like that. Just thinking through who has access to spaces. Um, all right, so then this was just showing the WeWork thing. So, you know, you use that book an event thing. It says you can hide, either have a private space with up to 25 guests, and that's where they'll have conference rooms and they'll tell you what size it is. And um, I usually use the common space option because I tend to draw a bigger crowd, um, and they're pretty easy. Um, and then you click through, and then you can literally put in what times and dates you're looking for and see a calendar of what spaces are available. And it tells you how many people they can each seat, and you can book it. Um, the smaller spaces, I think you can book instantly. The larger spaces, it'll like put in a request to the staff, and they have to approve it. But that's all been pretty quick for me. So just, I noticed it says we work at 220 North Green Street. Mm -hmm. Um, because I know the, the we work that I've reserved, they only have Mondays available, but it looks like these have alternate days, which is pretty good. Yeah, so basically each we work seems to have one day that they mm -hmm. do this. Okay. So I have used primarily one West Monroe, which I think okay. generally has Wednesdays from 5.30 to 7. And that's the other thing, is if you put in time, just general times, it won't necessarily show up anything. So I had to keep playing around with the times until I found like, ah, this specific WeWork is only ever available from 5.30 to 7 or any, or you could do like 6 to 7, but you can't do 5.30 to 7.30, 5.30 to 7 on Wednesdays. And once you know that, then you can see all the Wednesdays that's available. Um, the one on Illinois Street, I think is available on Mondays and that one is like th a three hour block. I think it's like six to nine. And then the one 220 North Green, I think is like six to eight on Tuesdays. So those are the three that I've kind of been using for the big spaces. For the private spaces, I don't really know. I'm sure there's a lot of, but I'm sure it's very similar where it's like this room is only available this specific time block, this specific day, but then all of that for a month. Um, so that, so, you know, and that, so you figure out your venue, then you have to think about like, what is my meetup? Right. And so that like, that is also just like, this is also like a really hard part of it is like, what is the content that people actually want to come for that I can actually produce on a budget of zero, right? Cause that's basically what we're all operating on. So I've ten, so I would generalize that there's three types of meetups that I've seen. Um, Something about learning, like that's what we're doing right now. Something about networking, um, structured or unstructured, uh, or something about sharing. So that could be like a book group or like a creative feedback uh, session, or even something like hiking together, you know, like it's a shared experience as opposed to like, you know, uh, building a skill or a network. So those are kind of the three ways I, the th things I see on Meetup. Um, so, uh, you know, my, as I've said, kind of 
event template that I have found very effective is a two hour event that starts with a 30 minute open networking thing, then a 60 minute talk. And you know, the talk is what the title of the event is, right? It's what the focus is. It's who is the speaker? What are you gonna learn? What are you gonna take away from this? Um, that's, that's the real meat of why people are coming is because they want to learn something. You know, for me, it's about YouTube, it's about Patreon, it's about podcasting, you know, and various, or it was about video skills last night. You know, any kind of thing that somebody could want to learn, um, whether they're a beginner or somewhere in the middle and just want to like refresh. Um, and then, you know, then the last 30 minutes are, you know, for Q and A or networking again. And then I also, so I think of that as like my event hits all three. Like you, there's a, always a learning component. There's always a networking component and there's a sharing component in that the end is a lot more like um, group discussion than it is like, uh, you know, one person talking at everybody else or everybody kind of doing their own thing. It's like kind of a, uh, the Q and A kind of has that feeling of, of sharing. And now that we also then have our after parties at a bar nearby, that is definitely just about like community and sharing, not about learning. And I could be about networking, but generally like there's like a core group of people who are just like have come to every event. Like they're the ones who are there because like they just like hanging out with everybody. So, um, so, you know, thinking about what are the types of events that fall within what that kind of gen the, those, the needs that you identified for your group, like, is there, what type of learning can I do? What type of networking could I do? I mean, maybe some of the, these don't apply to your group. And then like, is there a, a type of sharing? So for our group, so we, that one I described is what we've done a lot of times, but our second event, which um, was uh, actually more of a creative feedback event. So we had people send in advance videos um, up to 10 minutes, and then we would play the video, and then there would be five minutes for everybody to give people feedback on their video. So again, that's very specific to my group, but like that's mm -hmm. something that people, ha YouTubers in Chicago don't have like great creative networks all the time, people that they can get feedback from that's like actually substantial and not a two word comment. Mm -hmm. So that that was, yeah. So that was really valuable um, for people to be able to do that. So that was much more of like a sharing than a learning thing, but, um, uh, and that is way easier to plan because I don't have to find a speaker and a topic. Like mm -hmm. we literally just say like, this is it. All of you are responsible, mm -hmm. at, but like it's not hard to get people to sign up for that list. Um, so we easily had ten people, which you know filled the ninety minutes that we had, or whatever it was, um, something like that. So just thinking about are there different types of events I could do within the group mm -hmm. structure? Um, some that might be easier, uh, and some that might be harder, but have a bigger return. So. Uh, and then this is what events look like. You've all made events and come to events. So, um, you know, uh, there's a title, there, there's a photo. Again, have a photo. Um, there's details. I always put a breakdown of like what's happening during the time period so that the first 30 minutes is open networking and then that the presentation will start. Um, that's helpful that so if people know that they're going to be running late, they don't feel like they're missing anything. They know that there is that leeway. Uh, and now we have like our after party thing. Uh, and then, you know, having detailed instructions on how to find where the space is, obviously important today, um, uh, you know, in the how to find us section. Um, then there's a bunch of optional settings. So you can have events that repeat. Um, I don't think any of our groups are quite at the, the type of group that that would apply to, but other groups that can um, ask members a question. So some of the WeWorks require that you have the full name of each member and signing up for Meetup, you don't have to put a full name in there. So I have that question that says, what is the name that is on your ID? Because, you know, WeWork has never actually checked it in my experience, but they say they might. So I always put that on there. 
Uh, if you have a limit because the space only holds so many people, can not a problem you two have had, but like my first event, like it said they could only hold 40 people. So I capped it at 40 people. Didn't really matter because most of the people who are SVP don't show up. Um, but you know, it is important if you actually do have like a space limitation, whether you want to allow guests. Uh, I, I haven't at places that again, require each person to be on a list uh, because guests won't have like answer that question. Um, but other times I have allowed guests. Um, where there's a, a limit on when people can RSVP, so people couldn't RSVP literally at the last minute. Again, if you need to get a list to a sec building security person, then that's important. Uh, and then event fee. Um, so again, most of the events we've been talking about are free. Uh, one really interesting tactic that um, somebody brought up at one of these groups before was uh, they had an issue of you know, people not showing up. And um, so they uh, would charge, I think it was like $5. But then they said, like, if you show up, you get your $5 back. And so it was a way of making people actually show up when they RSVP, um, because they just would have a lot of RSVPs and maybe have a space limit, and then like, have all these people who still want to come. But so that was their problem. So their solution was, all right, it charges us $5. If they come, I refund it because there's a way you can refund the fees and nothing, then there's no processing fees that get thing directly through Meetup or something. And then the people who don't show up, you get money and then that goes into like uh, subsidizing the group. So that I thought was really interesting. I haven't implemented it because I don't have the problem of like hitting the space cap with RSVPs and then they don't show up. Um, I'm, it's hard to hit space caps. Um, all right, and then who? Who are you gonna get to come to your event, right? So I know this is probably the thing you've been waiting for the whole time. Um, but um, so you've set up like all this stuff of uh, this great event. Um, how do you find the people who um, are really gonna appreciate that event? That's a, a bug. Um, um, so your existing network, you know, friends, colleagues, um, who do you know who is in the same kind of situation? Like I knew some people who weren't necessarily in YouTube, but did podcasts. So I invited those people, um, um, you know, uh, then I did a lot of LinkedIn stalking. Um, so, uh, because LinkedIn is a really great search platform because you can say, show me people in Chicago and that have this word somewhere in their professional history, right? You can just type any word if it's in their resume. So, you know, uh, for me, that word was YouTube, right? And that was better than trying to search on YouTube because YouTube can't show you where people are. Uh, I also did Twitter where I would search for the word YouTube in people in Chicago on Twitter because some people will say, I have a YouTube channel and you, you, you're you often more likely to have a location on Twitter because you can have a location where again, YouTube, you can't. Um, and so sometimes I would find one person on one platform and then be like, oh, they're here, but I can't message them directly through Twitter because they're not following me. But then I would then take their name and look it up on LinkedIn or then go to their YouTube page and look up their business email address in the about section of their YouTube page uh, and then send that person, if I could get an email address, a personal email saying, okay. yep, uh, hey, you look like a person who does YouTube in Chicago. So am I, My the title was always like, you Chicago area YouTuber looking to connect. Uh, you know, you, I've done, I've internet stalked you and you seem like this. Uh, I've started a group. I like to meet people. Uh, being a YouTuber is lonely. Uh, that's why I started this group, thought you might be interested. Uh, so I found a lot of people through LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, and sent individual outreach. Uh, got a lot of non-responses, but a few people who said like, this is great, I'm definitely gonna show, and then actually showed up. People who responded and then never showed up, you know, I mean, but like, that is a way where I specifically, you know, used anything I could to try and find the people and invite them directly. Uh, because, you know, I, 
when I think about putting on a meetup, it's basically like planning a private party at your house, you know, like that level of work of it involving, but then all the people who are going to come are total strangers. So like, how do you get strangers to show up to a private party at your house? That's a really hard problem, right? <laughs> That's essentially the problem you have of like a really bespoke small event that is not going to be like widely promoted and getting strangers to show up. So mm -hmm. the more you can think about who is that ideal person and find them anyway on the internet, whether that's, you know, through a uh, forum or social media, think about like, what are the words they might use to describe themselves that I could use to like reverse engineer it. Like for me, I had it pretty easy because like YouTube, Twitch, podcast, I knew that was my audience mm -hmm. and I was able to Chicago search them. Uh, I actually hit the search limit on LinkedIn. Uh, and so I signed up for a free month trial of the business plan so that I could continue searching and send up to 15 unsolicited LinkedIn messages. Mm -hmm. And if people respond to those messages, then you get that credit back. Um, so I did that uh, during the, like my month of starting it up. Once I had that first event ready, like mm -hmm. I spent, you know, that month finding as many people. Uh, and now that I'm searching for a job again, I have signed up for that version of LinkedIn again, have used it because I had a list of all the people I couldn't message the first time and I've been messaging them now. So how did you, uh, like, what was your first event? Mm -hmm. Cause it seems like you've been, your group has been pretty successful right after the Yeah. Event. So my very first event was how to turn your YouTube channel into a business because that is, um, just one of the things that why people start YouTube is they they're like, I know you can make money through YouTube. I don't necessarily know how or why, or I've tried it and I hasn't been super successful. Um, that was like my focus for years was trying to do that. So I knew that was like a core thing. And then it was me talking and I managed to get two other local YouTubers to show up and talk about their experience. So it was a panel of the three of us, each with a little different, I talked about ad revenue. Another person talked about sponsored content and the third person talked about, oh, Patreon, cause they had a Patreon that they were getting money through. So it was, you know, different perspectives and, um, you know, I, a lot of it was just, there was a lot of pent up enthusiasm and desire for this. So like mm -hmm. the response to that first event, like I haven't had as major of a response any, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of just people signing up. Like I had 50 plus people RSVP for that first wow. event. And like now it's usually 20 or 30. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, uh, maybe we've gotten up to 40 again since then, but yeah. So mm -hmm. part of it was just, there were all, all those, it's definitely that first event, like, when your group starts, they market a lot and people are like, yeah, I definitely want this. So, um, uh, but you know, we, uh, I'd say about like half of the people who came to that first event have come to another event and half of the people have never been back. Like I haven't looked at the statistics, but just thinking through who was there. Uh, and you know, some of those people will RSVP to events and then not show up or are in the Facebook group. Um, so, um, yeah. Um, and then like our second event was that creative feedback thing. Um, uh, mm -hmm. and then our third event was, um, what was November? Oh, the third event was best practices for YouTube thumbnails and titles because, and that specifically was an idea of somebody in the group that they wanted to do. And like, uh, a, another group member did research and presented it and I added some of my perspective. Um, fourth event, uh, I got this guy who uh, is has a very successful Patreon page and is local to talk specifically about Patreon. Um, so again, yeah, I always try to build it around like what is um, that piece. The one in January which ended up being in February because of like the terrible winter storm was poorly attended because it was it's the middle of winter. Um, but that was on analytics. And then, yeah, last night was video production. And a lot of the ideas for those things have come specifically from members saying mm -hmm. like, this is what I need. Like 
I am shooting on an iPhone and editing just on my computer. I don't know anything about video production. So like it was clear that that was a need. Um, uh, so, and then like, I also do a lot of social media promotions. So, you know, I post them on my LinkedIn page, on my Twitter, on my Facebook. I, in, I, I put it out to all my friends, even though I know most of them aren't going to be interested, but also just like, it lets them know it's happening and it could possibly lead to something, you know, you never know. Um, then depending on the venue, you might get some cross promotion. So last night we were at 1871. Mm -hmm. Any event that happens there is put on their general event calendar. So we had one person show up who learned about it through the venue, which I didn't even know was gonna happen, but that was a bonus. Uh, and then most of the people who show up are random meetup people in my experience, right? Like. I didn't specifically reach out to this person. They didn't see it on my social media because there's no way they saw it. It's just like they went to meet up, they saw the group or they saw the event and they said, yes, that's for me, right? And that is the largest and the most confusing group, right? Like um, you don't, unless they actually show up and you talk to them, you don't know why they came or didn't came or RSVP'd and, or didn't RSVP. Um, so, you know, there's a lot there that it's just about like how how much how how big is my group, and then of that group, how many people typically RSVP? Yep. Uh, is it about the time or date? Right. I always do my events like in the after work hours um, downtown because that to me is the most accessible possible thing in lo in Chicago. Right. But. I have people who come in from the suburbs and like I see other groups that will have downtown meetups versus suburb meetups and things like that. So just like, what is it that, you know, where is the audience? Uh, is that part of the issue that, or, you know, when are they available? There's so many, like all the things that lead to a random meetup person saying like, yeah, I could go to that. And then like that they will then not actually show up right, because like something came up or they never put it on their actual calendar, they, right, like you don't, like I always put any meetup I s sign up for on my Google calendar, so it's on my schedule. Most people probably don't do that. They just get the emails through meetup, you know, they usually send you an email, what, like three days in advance and like the day of, like, hey, remember, you're going to this meetup. Um, but just because they said yes doesn't mean they mean yes. Um, all right, so here, okay, so action steps. So I broke this into three parts, before an event, during the event, and after the event. Okay. So you wanna schedule your first meetup like when you launch your group. You two are both past that, but just like uh, until you have a meetup on the calendar, you can't really get people to like connect through it. Um, before any new event, you need to find a space and time, figure out different types of easy events uh, as well as, you know, what, what are different events you could do? Uh, sending one-to-one -one email invites to people, like if it's somebody even in your personal network, rather than just doing a blanket Facebook thing, like thinking about like, hey, I know this person is in a similar situation, you know, looking for a new job, uh, unemployed, perennially unemployed, underemployed, let me email that person and say, I'd love to have you come to an event or, you know, who, who can you talk to more about it? Or that person that you talk to on LinkedIn, you know, following up. Anybody that you've connected with, you know, sending them a personalized invite uh, in addition to whatever the meetup would do. Uh, and then expect a 50% attrition rate from RSVPs. So that was something I learned in my very first, uh, one of these meetups was that basically, if 20 people say yes, 10 expect 10 people to show up. And that's a really good turnout rate for meetup. Um, so, you know, if two people RSVP, I mean, eight people are RSVP'd for tonight and we've got three. Um, and that's because Veronica wasn't going to come, so she doesn't even really count, but you know, still like, and most of those people RSVP'd in the last few days too, and still mm -hmm. aren't here. Yeah. But I was like, if I get five people, that'll be an outstanding attendance. Mm. <laughs> but, or two great people. Or, or yeah. two great people, right? But like, I mean, like you were excited about yeah. you had two people at your first meetup. That's yeah. that's actually yeah. You know, there are I lots of people. Five RCPs. I think I'm myself. Yeah. So 
And well, I guess three total people because I RSVP myself and needed. Mm hmm. That's how it works. So yeah, fifty percent sounds about right. Yep. Um, so I think last night we maybe had like a 60% attendance rate. I was like, wow, this is like amazing. Yeah. Like, and we were in a smaller room cause like, I was like, yeah, like 25 people are SVP. Like we'll be lucky if 12 people show up. Right. And so he was like, okay, it's 12 person conference room. And then like, we had to bring in extra chairs and it was like, yeah. felt like standing room only. <laughs> like it was still like a small room, but like, yeah. Yeah. because it was, um, you know, you sp set your expectation down low, then you can be excited about a five person turnout, a 12 person turnout. Um, at the event, bring name tags. Um, so I, and I have a checklist that I do for every single event I set up that I go through myself. Like, yes, I need to make sure I have name tags and Sharpies in my bag today uh, when I leave the house. Uh, I collect email addresses. Um, that's like an optional thing. So you could do that pen and paper on a sheet, just like write your name and email address. And then you could just even have those in your personal email so that you could email people individually after or send like a mass BCC email again as another way of like keeping in touch with people. Uh, I have a MailChimp thing and it's all fancy and I do it through a laptop, but um, greet every new member. Um, again, in a small thing, that's not too hard, but as you have a 10 or 15 person turnout, like as people are coming in, like if somebody's come before, you know, say hi to them, but you don't give them as much attention as anybody who's new because you want to like learn that person's name and know why they came because that is the most valuable information is why did somebody new come, right? Once you, if you've got somebody hooked who's returning, like that's great, right? You don't need to worry about them. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can, you, you do, you, know, you want to develop that relationship, but the new people, like I just beeline for them every event. Um, take photos, um, you know, again, that just goes back to like marketing the event. Like you have photos to share afterwards. You can put them uh, as your group photo. Um, and uh, also like a future event photo. Now I just use that main photo of a bunch of our members as like, this is what events look like. So that's what to expect. Uh, I've used that same photo like five times. Um, and then delegate any possible task. So again, this is more of an issue once you get more people turning out is that like as people are coming in and like you're setting up or working with the speaker, um, like if there's a door that locks, you can have somebody like say, hey, you know, so-and-so, could you help me out and go uh, work the door just to help let people get in. I had that at one of the WeWorks that was like after business hours. So there was the door downstairs was locked. So I asked somebody else to go down there and do that for me. So I didn't have to spend the whole time, 30 minutes leading up to the presentation, standing downstairs, letting people in. Or um, could you take some photos during the talk Ooh. on your phone, right? Um, so any of those little tiny things, could you greet people upstairs because I have to go do this other thing? You know, any of those little things. Um, or um, so my very first event, you know, uh, I was amazed that I had like, you know, 20 people turn out and like met each of them individually. And then like afterwards, they're like, this is so great and blah, blah, blah. It'd be great if, you know, we all could get a list of each other's channels. I was like, Jason, I'm going to ask you to go into the meetup group when you get home and make a post asking people to share their channels, right? So like he was asking for something from the group, which would have taken work from me, not that much, but I turned him into a helper by asking him to be the person who made that message so that it's not all coming from me. And then also that made him feel like he's doing something and now he's a committee member and has run an event because mm -hmm. basically he came up to me and was enthusiastic and I was like, I'm gonna harness that enthusiasm mm -hmm. and put it to use. So he planned our second event. Oh. Um, so he was came to the first event and he planned the second event. Like I had a phone call with him like um, a week after the event and like talked through it and got him set up and then um, a person who came to our first event and our second event, I was like, she's on the committee now too. <laughs> so she planned our third event. Uh, and somebody who had then been bringing donuts just for everybody because 
he was starting a donut business anyway. It's a whole thing. But like, I was like, he's been like catering our events. And I joked him like, would you want to be in charge of catering? We don't actually have catering, but he's now ha planned our sixth event, right? So I developed a committee by seeing like, who are the people who are returning, are passionate, asking them to do little things and then like being like, all right, could you do this other thing? And I will walk you through every step of like setting up a thing on Meetup, but they are now officially event organizers. They have the power to set up events. Uh, they are admins in the Facebook group. Um, they post more frequently there because like I've asked them to be part of the group and then recognize that mm -hmm. as, uh, and that came from, you know, being at these events and hearing people like struggling to do everything on their own. So I, I have just, anytime somebody has asked for things, I have always kind of redirected that into seeing if I can trick them into doing it <laughs> um, a verse, or if it's something that really should be me. And then I'm spending less of my energy on things that other people can do. Um, so yeah. Um, and that, oh, and then after the event. So I also then reach out to basically every, so I go to the, um, the event listing and you can see all the people who are RSVP'd. If people didn't show up, I move them to no. You can mark them as no show, like if you want to flag them as like, oh, I would only worry about that if like they had to pay or it's like really important, but you can just say like Marcus didn't attend. Mm -hmm. So I just do that so I have a better record of like people who actually showed up. And then also just like, it's a helpful thing to be like, yeah, that person, they did show up. And if they don't have a photo, sometimes I'm like, I'm not sure, I'll just leave them. But, and then the people who did show up, then, you know, usually I, they have their full name uh, I will, or I got them to write that down on that sheet of paper mm -hmm. and then I will find them on Facebook. And if they're not in the group, like invite them to the group. If they're, uh, the Facebook group, uh, I will often connect with them on LinkedIn depend like whether I send them a Facebook friend invite, like that's, it's a little more delicate. Cause I think like that's, there's like a line there. Whereas people will basically accept LinkedIn things from anybody they kind of know. Um, or if they're on Twitter, I might like follow up on Twitter, but just like reinforcing like that we are socially connected um, because we have met. Uh, and then they will also, in addition to being in the meetup group, just as I post about things about the group in those other places, that's another way they might see everything. Um, posting photos, um, you know, uh, and, and now also because I'm friends with some of those people, if they're in a photo, Facebook will automatically recognize them and tag them uh, for me, um, which is creepy, but convenient. Um, if there were slides or a presentation doing some kind of follow-up, whether that's through Meetup or another outlet of, of that and announcing the next event, ideally you would have the next event planned the day of the event and then you can tell people um, that has not been the case for me a lot of the times. Uh, and then like continuing conversation in, for me, the Facebook group. Um, so what are the things that my people care about that we can talk about between events? Like I see an interesting article about YouTube. I share that in the Facebook group. Uh, and having done that, other people now do that or they'll share like, oh, I just passed this milestone on my channel. So just like what are the ways that, you know, you can reinforce the connections and community between events? Um, so yeah, uh, and then my last section was going to be how to ask for help. Um, I basically already talked through that was just like delegate everything, uh, networking constantly, like to what your point was earlier, I have re talked to so many strangers, mm -hmm. like not only in person at events, but just like reaching out through LinkedIn, um, because I'm always on the lookout for future speakers who could also potentially be members because uh, the line between them is pretty thin for me. Um, so I've messaged lots of people on LinkedIn who uh, have done presentations uh, on this stuff in the past and are local and been like, I'd love to have you talk. And so one of them has never responded to any of the messages I sent, but showed up at the event last night. Yes. And he wasn't, I wasn't able to talk to him because he came in late and then like left immediately. Um, so I wasn't able to, to do my normal greet thing, but I was like, but he showed up. So I know he paid attention a little bit yeah, yeah, uh, and I'm gonna message him again because I really want him to get, because he's a public accountant that focuses on YouTubers <laughs> and, and Twitch streamers. I'm like, and has given a talk on this. I was like, 
please give your talk again for my group. <laughs> so anyway, um, and then, you know, depending on like where you're at, doing that idea of charging for an event, uh, like if you're getting too many uh, RSVPs that don't show up, like you want to make that attrition better. Um, one person was talking about, yeah, how he really wants experts in neuroscience to show up rather than people who are just generally interested because it's like they talk about academic papers. And so his problem, see, it's too many people showing up at his events that, that aren't the right people, right? I was like, do you realize everybody else wants your problem, right? <laughs> right? Like too many people. But for him, it's like, how can he make it more exclusive so there's a higher barrier to entry so only the people who are really committed and will really contribute show up? Like, so that's where putting a membership fee to be part of the group or specifically per event. And then that can also help with if you're over 50 members, you have to pay to have a group. I don't know if you knew that yet. That's an unpleasant fact you will learn when you get to 50 members. Um, but you already pay just to have a meetup group. So you're saying you pay what? Do you yeah. pay to have a? Yeah, you do. Oh. 15 bucks yeah, they changed it. Oh, they yeah. changed it. All right, yeah. never mind. It used to be different. So I don't know how the distinction works now. But. Well, if you're already paying, then welcome to the club. <laughs> uh, I think it's $15 a month, and then, like, when I went over 50, and they says, oh, well, you know, you can pay, I forget what the flat fee was, but the flat fee for six months, mm, you know, right. and they're going to charge me again after six months is, you know, if I have more than 50 people. Oh. Right. I'm going to stop the live stream since nobody showed up anyway. Um. So that's the presentation. <laughs>